Uh, my name is Heather Miller. I'm a, a fire risk reduction specialist for the Office of State Fire Marshal for the Central Oregon region. So I cover Crook, Deschutes, Jefferson, and Wheeler counties. And I uh, really appreciate you guys joining us today. Uh, we are going to be talking about the five E's of community risk reduction in regards to how it applies in the wildfire settings. And so I want to share my screen here with you guys. And um, I just want to kick it off with uh, really reviewing that um, concept of what community risk reduction is, what we're looking at, and what those five E's are. So uh, really, we're looking at those concepts of uh, you know, what kind of engineering can we employ with reducing risk in a community, um, what our emergency response plans and how we set that up, um, what kind of economic incentives or penalties can we introduce to folks to uh, help motivate them to reduce risk in the community? Uh, how can we educate folks and get them to change behaviors uh, to reduce that risk? And then um, are there enforcement practices that we can deploy to, uh, to reduce that risk as well? You know, and really we're looking at you know, that risk reduction as you know, those programs and actions and services that um, the community works towards to prevent or mitigate loss of life and property. Um, with disasters. And so uh, with that, I'm going to introduce, we've got a couple of great speakers here today. We've got Justice Stones. Um, he is the Wildfire Mitigation Officer for the City of Austin in Texas. Um, Justice serves um, there and, and helps with uh, Austin and the surrounding areas to embrace the wildfire preparedness um, and become uh, Fire adapted in those systems. Um, recently, Austin became one of the largest municipalities in the country to adopt the ICC uh, Wildland Urban Interface Code. Um, so they're really focusing on that wildfire resilience and uh, looking towards the future and growth that they have there. Uh, Justice also served on multiple committees, and uh, including the International Association of Fire Chiefs Wildland P Fire Policy Committee, uh, the NFPA Technical Committee for 1140, and uh, He's also part of the Fire Adapting Communities Network and a technical specialist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, our other speaker is going to be Chris Chambers. Um, he is the division chief with the Ashland Fire and Rescue. He's been there since 2002 and uh, has worked on many wildfire safety grants with lots of private landowners and co-authored the 2004 Ashland Community Wildfire Protection Plan and the 2005 Jackson County Integrated Fire Plan and participates in the um, implementing the Ashland Forest Resiliency Stewardship Project. So, um, both are working hard out there and uh, doing great work in their communities. And so I will pass it over to Justice to um, share along what he has um, going on in his community. So with that, Go ahead, Justice. Great. Uh, thank you, Heather. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yep. That's not mine. I'll stop share here. Jump on there. Or... We're still seeing your screen, Heather. Stop oh, it. there you go. Are you seeing my presentation now? Great. Thank you for that, Chris. All right. Well, I'm really excited to be here with you all today and um, share a little bit about the work that we've done in Austin to help accelerate the process of us being more resilient to wildfire. And um, I would like to um, just give credit where credit is due as part of that process has been learning from and benchmarking with um, other great departments across the country or, who are leading in the field and Ashland, Oregon is certainly a prime example of that. So I'm excited to be co-presenting with Chris, learned a lot about uh, what we're doing in Austin from the great work they're doing there in Oregon. So um, I just did want to start out with a little bit of background and information on Austin's wildfire risk. Um, we've quantified wildfire risk down to the parcel level and um, that has uh, good and bad implications, but it allows us to get very specific with uh, communicating to residents uh, that are individual risk, but it helps us from an overall planning standpoint uh, to have a common operating picture of risk. And I know that's something that's emerging in Oregon rapidly. And so a few things to know about Austin in relation to risk is 
Um, if you've read the CoreLogic report, um, we're the highest potential economic losses outside of California. So the cost to rebuild Boston would be astronomical based on projected losses. We have over 250 homes at risk in um, Austin and Travis County, and we're ranked third in the nation for uh, the number of um, and potential for wildfire losses. So we certainly have uh, wildfire issues. One of our challenges is that our um, fire seasons are driven by drought and those may not emerge on an annual basis. It might be two, three, five years before we see our next fire season, uh, which is kind of a recipe for folks forgetting about it. And so we have to work hard to constantly keep wildfire on everybody's radar. Um, the way that we've mapped wildfire risk um, is somewhat unique in that uh, we look at the vegetative fuel hazards and the potential fire behavior um, impacts from that standpoint, but we also wanted to quantify what the potential urban conflagration in our community was, and so we built a map that um, identifies structure proximity and structure density, and that's what you're seeing here is those homes directly adjacent to the Wui boundary that also have adjacent to adjacency to other structures are the highest risk uh, classified structures in Austin. And we have 647 miles of wildland urban interface um, based on the way that our community was uh, developed. So we have a, a permanent WUI, which is unique in Texas because we're uh, predominantly privately owned and private property, about 70, 97% of the land in Texas is private property. Um, our fire environment is, um, I think, unique in some ways. Uh, we have uh, statewide uh, wildfire seizures very often. And so there's multiple simultaneous starts across the landscape. Um, because the fragmentation um, and development in our community, um, we're faced with relatively small fires that can result in large losses. And very quickly, even though we're a robust fire department uh, from a traditional structure protection standpoint, um, can be easily outpaced by um, these fires occurring and us not being able to rely on our traditional mutual aid partners and response mechanisms. And so when we looked at wildfire, we recognized that, sure, it's important to the fire department. And because we're um, at the front end of those impacts and, and we've inherited decisions that other people have made throughout time that we now manage the risk of. Um, but we also want to recognize that wildfire impacts other people's values as well. And if we want to take a community-wide approach, we had to look at um, the way wildfire could impact um, the values that people care about when they wake up in the morning. And not everybody lives in the world where we do, where life safety is the first thing you think about. Some folks are focused on habitat or um, green infrastructure or managing our critical infrastructures or watershed management. And so we worked really hard to overlay wildfire risk on top of the values that the rest of the community identified as being an important. And I'll talk a little bit about the process for, for that. So it really takes a fire community to prepare for wildfires. Um, and uh, we practiced this as we went into the development of our um, local strategy for wildfire risk, which I'll talk about here in just a second. But that meant engaging our land managers, the folks that are responsible for managing our wildlands, ensuring that we had leadership intent from our elected officials, um, make sure, making sure we had grassroots support from our communities and our neighborhoods. Austin has 26 uh, nationally recognized firewise communities and leads the state in that effort. We also have an alliance of those firewise communities that uh, really show up for us and the rest of the community when key initiatives are being discussed at city council or county commissioner's court. Uh, so that grassroots component is really important. And integrating local businesses, we learn from Mc Fort McMurray and other fires that uh, commercial and governmental buildings are not exempt. So not only do we have to engage our partners in the government as a cooperator, but also as a potential um, impact from wildfire. Of course, uh, conversations with our emergency management to identify planning and funding mechanisms. Um, and so all of these voices have to come together to really address the wildfire risk in a community. Um, and leaving anybody out of the discussion um, doesn't allow you to maximize on the community resources that may have um, ownership in this issue uh, that you may have not considered in the past until you look at it from others' perspectives. Austin developed a community wildfire protection plan in 2014, and we're in the process of updating that plan now. Um, it was one of the first plans that was modeled after the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy. And so we built it based on those three tiers of 
safe and effective response to wildfire, uh, fire adapted communities and fire resilient landscapes. So how does this relate to the five E's of community risk reduction? Um, I think one of the messages and takeaways is whether you're a fire department that um, is fortunate enough to have dedicated wildfire staff like we are in Austin and Ashland, or you're working with fire departments um, to embrace their role in community risk reduction, um, this can be done with existing resources. Of course, more is always better, but we have folks that are focused on community risk reduction, and it's not that big of a leap to incorporate wildfire hazard risk reduction and safety into that model. And so if we look at things like um, Austin adopted the International um, Wildland Urban Interface Code, that's enforcement and education and action related to wildfire. We have certain um, codes within the city, uh, so weed abatement ordinance, um, brush pile ordinance, other things that maybe weren't intended for wildfire that we can leverage in our communities to enhance the wildfire safety. Um, the education is critical and that starts with, and I think all of this starts with understanding of the wildfire risk, um, developing a plan to communicate and articulate that risk back to your community and the public that we serve. Um, using existing systems like the National Fire Danger Rating System, um, which very often you know we see in adjacent to national forest. We don't have very many of those in Texas. And so where you see those in Texas is in front of our fire stations. We want to remind every day, everyone every day of what the fire danger is and that we live in a fire environment. Um, and so emergency response is critical. And when it comes to wildfire, there's no component of response that's more important than evacuation planning. And so for example, in Austin, we have a wild, wildfire specific evacuation plan that we then use the Ready, Set, Go program to align our public with that evacuation strategy. So we're both on the same page when it comes to um, responding effectively to wildfire. And then economic incentives. Um, how do we make wildfire equitable? Um, Austin and Travis County is a land of the have and have nots. And so in general, um, our community um, is, is very well off. And most of the, the residents who can afford to live in the western part of the county, which is our hill country, um, don't live down in the lowlands and the grasslands where we get fast moving fires that are running into older homes. And so how do we incentivize and level the playing field for wildfire risk reduction? Um, we're working to access uh, different grants uh, specifically designed for equi with equity in mind. Um, to be able to communicate what those risks are uh, to our vulnerable populations through um, the Austin and Travis County Wildfire Vulnerability Viewer, which highlights um, those citizens who would face challenges in recovering, preparing and recovering from wildfire. And so um, there's really direct connections and nexuses with the five E's of community risk reduction and how we're approaching uh, wildfire preparedness. And I think essentially, it's an extension of our traditional community risk reduction program. It doesn't have to be this new foreign concept for fire departments and communities. We can leverage the resources we have uh, while we're acquiring additional resources we may need. So um, we had some recommendations that were developed by Headwaters Economics that really helped um, guide us moving forward in our wildfire safety. We created a wildfire division to help implement our community wildfire protection plan. We integrated wildfire into various departmental and citywide performance measures. And so now it's a part of everyone's job in the city to address wildfire appropriately. We are training our operational staff to be able to respond effectively and safely to these um, wildfires. A large department with 1200 firefighters like Austin, um, it's roulette as to whether you may go on a big fire in your whole career. And so we wanna expose our firefighters to fire behavior and we use tools like prescribed fire to uh, help educate and, and train them. And we have a strategic uh, plan that is uh, incorporated from our wildfire division all the way through the city's comprehensive plan. In addition to that, we organized a local wildfire coalition to help us with the implementation of that community wildfire protection plan and ensure that we were collaborative in our approach. Um, as I mentioned, we adopted that wildfire protection plan. We refined it our net risk analysis to include um, local level vulnerable populations, as I mentioned. Most of the risk uh, maps are based on fire intensity. And so we also incorporated rate of spread, which helped us illustrate the risk to some of our 
more vulnerable populations in our grassland areas. Um, we created a wildfire hub so we could have transparency and share with the public the work that's happening to protect them. We want them to know that we're taking this serious and they should as well. And then we participate in interdepartmental and interagency working groups and planning teams. Um, well, things I'd like to say, if you want someone to um, be included in your planning effort and to help you bolster your community's wildfire resiliency, then it's important to show up for them in the ways that they need. And so I serve on the city's urban forestry leadership team, our green infrastructure priority program, and many others. And some of those meetings are relevant. Uh, some of them aren't as relevant, um, but I'm able to ask those same cooperators to show up and help me because I've uh, expressed the willingness to, to help them as well. And then we've in integrated wildfire into our climate resiliency planning, uh, which has been extremely helpful um, in acqu acquisition of resources and funding associated with wildfire mitigation. And kind of finally, we've included wildfire in the public land management plan. Um, we have about 70,000 acres of wildland in Austin, and there was no planning in place for the majority of those lands. And so we helped our Parks and Recreation Department acquire a, a fire management planner. Um, we've incorporated our recommendations into plans across the county. And so our plans have become other people's plans and, and vice versa. As I mentioned, we incorporate their values. Um, we developed a prescribed fire permitting guideline to streamline the process of um, prescribed burn um, implementation because we want more fire on the ground. We use prescribed fire to educate residents about um, our fire environment and how um, it's a matter of time when wildfires do come back to an area. As I mentioned before, we adopted the wildland urban interface code um, and are aggressively implementing that since our adoption in 2021. We've um, had about 7,500 homes that are uh, compliant with the code. And these homes are becoming the buffer for the interior, more at-risk areas in our community. And there's a link where you can check out uh, information on that code. So what's the fire service role in wildfire risk reduction? For me, I think it's giving your community situational awareness, helping them to look at fire uh, from your perspective as a, a fire professional, to communicate that through a risk assessment, to help them understand uh, why we need to take action at all levels. Um, personal responsibility within the fire department is to have pre-plans and movie response plans so we can be safe and effective when we're responding to wildfire. Being honest with the public and give them a realistic expectation of outcome, um, that's a really important point. Um, we have a tendency to want to help people feel safe and sound. And that's why we're here, but we're not helping them if we're not being honest about what they can expect. In fact, we're causing harm. A lot of the research on PTSD associated with these wildfires is not understanding the potential impacts and outcomes of a fire before it strikes. So we can inoculate people from these impacts by giving them a clear understanding of the situation we're in. And then leveraging mitigation into operational advantage. When our um, city's out doing fuels mitigation, we want our operational folks to know where those fire breaks are and so they can leverage them. Um, and then to ensure through things like voluntary compliance and our wildland urban interface that our communities are defendable when the next fire season strikes. We have a long way to go, but we're making progress. So some of the takeaways I'd like to leave with you is start with a shared understanding of wildfire risk. You need that common operating platform. And I know that's rapidly emerging for the state of Oregon. Um, it's really about people, relationships, and trust, not buildings and not trees. It starts with people. That's why we're doing this. And so if you can help people change their minds and understand their role in wildfire, um, you can minimize their fear and maximize their proactiveness. We want to demonstrate what success looks like through voluntary measures. Uh, we, we worked with our green building program to um, have a rating for wildfire risk that developers and builders were contributing and participating in long before we adopted the WUI code. And we were able to point back to that, that uh, they're already doing um, the work that we're asking. And we just need everybody to align, be in line with that. We want to seek support and buy-in from all levels, from grassroots to elected officials. Um, you need that leadership intent and you need the groundswell of community support to really be effective. Establish a trusted point of contact to communicate with the public and stakeholders and ask for help early and often. Um, I think I can say this for sure. I need it all the time and I ask for help um, all the time. And timing is critical. Um, and I think that's a, a lesson learned by, by everyone that um, waiting and biding your time sometimes is your best strategy. And so you can have things lined out for when that opportunity strikes uh, that you're able to maximize on that. 
And so um, thank you very much for allowing me to just share uh, some of my thoughts and time with you. I want to give plenty of time uh, for Chris to share with you as well. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm happy to be um, on the call and looking forward to sticking around. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Justice, and appreciate your uh, presentation there. So we'll switch over to uh, Keith Chambers here and have him share out his screen. Thank you, Heather. Let me get my share working here. How's that look? You're good to go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I uh, as Heather mentioned, I'm a Chris Chambers Welfare Division Chief down here in Southern Oregon. Uh, nice to be among so many Oregonians, but also uh, folks from other states as well. And uh, as you saw from Justice's presentation, the city of Austin has definitely been a North Star in wildfire prevention for many years. And I'm uh, really lucky to have called Justice a colleague for uh, a lot of those years of my career. Uh, we work together on a lot of different programs uh, connected through the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network and um, have got a lot of inspiration there. So thanks, Justice, for your presentation and, and all your good work. Um, I am going to jump in here. So uh, if you don't know Ashland, um, we are a small community, about 22,000 people, um, permanent residents, uh, but we do have uh, also students at Southern Oregon University, uh, several thousand who live here on and off but also a huge visitor economy, um, up to 300,000 tourist visits a year. So our community does uh, swell and shrink throughout the year, but uh, the swelling happens during fire season um, when uh, we're most vulnerable. And you know, one of the points of Ashland is we are embedded in the forest of the Siskiyou Mountains. It's hard to tell where Ashland starts and the forest ends or vice versa. Uh, and certainly that um, speaks a lot to the potential for wildfires impacting our town, which they have throughout the uh, past decade. Plus, numerous fires have evacuated people. We've lost homes inside the city limits. The Almeda fire, um, one of the most destructive fires in Oregon history, started inside the city limits, damaged some Ashland homes, and of course went on to cause a lot of damage and destruction in uh, adjacent communities. Uh, we're gonna refer back to that embeddedness uh, here. I like this quote from uh, Yogi Berra. Always gotta have a Yogi Berra quote. He had so many, but um, I think this speaks to the planning component and um, knowing where your program is going, uh, creating, creating strategic alignment amongst your goals and your different plans in your departments and your cities and counties is really important. Um, one thing that's really helped us is aligning with the um, with the, co the National co Wildland Fire Management Cohesive Strategy, just uh, called the Cohesive Strategy, with its three legs of fire adapted communities, resilient landscapes, and safe, effective wildfire response, all tied together by good science. Um, that helps align us with uh, national priorities that are also embraced by state and local governments. It's a common language that we speak. Justice has some of that language in his presentation all the way down in Texas. So it pays to be on the same page. And when you're writing grants to be able to talk that language, that helps immensely. So we're going to look a little bit about the uh, the resilient landscapes piece first here. Uh, this is just a quick uh, uh, graph or a, a map showing all the areas that are in a high degree of departure in terms of forest resilience. Um, and needing work on a landscape scale. The Rogue Basin really pops out in the whole Pacific Northwest as a place with the deep dark red, meaning we are a big tar target for wildfire and needing a lot of work in our forests to bring them into back to a state of forest health and resilience so that we can have wildfires and not necessarily have the destruction that goes with them. Here's an example of a forest in uh, right on the edge of Ashland, highly overgrown, uh, what used to be really fire dependent and frequent fire forests that were uh, openly spaced with big trees now are packed with little trees. You can see a lot of those trees are marked to be cut. Uh, we have gone through and thinned a lot of these overly dense forests, uh, but there's still a lot more work to do in our neighborhood uh, and definitely across the state. Our flagship project is called Ashen Forest Resiliency. 
Um, it's a collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service, the City of Ashland, Lomakotsi Restoration Project, and the Nature Conservancy. Um, we've been working on this project for 13 years now as of this spring. Um, so we're getting towards the end of this 15-year time frame. Uh, we've managed to treat 13,000 acres across a 58,000 acre footprint um, using a lot of the tools that Justice talked about and that I'll elaborate more on as well. This includes our city and parks, forest lands. We have about 1,100 acres and growing. Uh, we just bought some new properties and put them in public ownership uh, just this last couple of weeks. Um, so uh, we're constantly tending those areas, working with our parks department and our parks commission, um, advocating for budgets, uh, sharing workload, and making sure that we're working towards common goals. And that's part of the larger landscape, which you'll see in this map. Um, the, the dashed outline is the 58,000 acres, which is kind of our like fire shed, if you will, um, where fire would come from to impact the city of Ashland and our municipal watershed, which is upstream from uh, downtown Ashland and being Ashland Creek, running right through the middle of town. Uh, so there's city ownership, there's private, and there's uh, federal ownership through the U.S. Forest Service, the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest. We pride ourselves in saying that we've created this all lands restoration project <clears throat> and um, truly trying to erase the boundaries between private, uh, municipal, and federal. That 13,000 acre footprint is shown in the dark green uh, outlined areas that have treatments, uh, as well as the red on private and the blue on city. Uh, that encompasses the over 13,000 acres of work that we have um, completed over the past uh, decade plus. A lot of that in our wildland urban interface. Some of the tools we used, one of them, uh, helicopter logging, you know, heavily forested landscape, overly dense. We need to get trees out of there to get back to some sort of um, equilibrium in the forest, reduce ground fire danger, reduce ladder fuels and ground fuels. Uh, one of those tools in the toolbox uh, is uh, actually using commer utilizing commercial extraction selling the logs. Uh, we've actually recouped about $13 million uh, and back to our project through the sale of byproduct logs, leaving the larger trees behind. And this is not a clear cut. Uh, this is forest thinning for ecological uh, op objectives and forest health. And then of course, dealing with ladder fuels like this uh, dense brush field, which is right on the edge of homes and town, uh, putting that uh, into burn piles, burning it, uh, and in the process, creating a lot of jobs uh, for the local economy. Uh, another tool in the toolbox, ground-based thinning, uh, using machinery from existing roads and skid paths to extract uh, overly dense trees, again, selling them to local mills. Um, and then dealing with the slash afterwards is a key component of that using prescribed fire. We use a combination of pile burning and then broadcast burning or underburning, as we call it, reintroducing the natural role of fire and trying to make that happen at least once a decade to maintain fuel levels low uh, once we've gotten them to the point where fire can do the work for us. We have a pretty aggressive prescribed burn program that um, the city uh, has sponsored since 2012. The federal government, uh, US Forest Service, uh, also administers that on uh, federal land. And um, we're able to get a lot of fire on the ground each year. Um, not as much as we want. There are a lot of challenges um, with weather and smoke. This is a particularly smoky morning after a, uh, an aggressive day of burning. And um, that creates a lot of challenges. Uh, a community that's inundated with smoke during the summertime, as many communities uh, in Oregon and across the West are during the summer months. Um, to convince people after tolerating all that summer smoke that we need to tolerate more smoke has been a particular challenge. And we have created a program around that called SmokeWise Ashland that I'll talk about. Um, and it, it continues to be a challenge. Uh, we just were burning last week and had uh, people upset about smoke interrupting their evening out on the town. And with as much of the tourism economy that we rely on, it, it is an extra challenge to have people understand if they're just visitors, why there's so much smoke. Um, we created a community smoke response plan to address that particular issue. We've handed out HEPA air purifiers, uh, 
it's uh, we did a 601 batch, but now we're up to 650. And we have 30 more that we just got in a grant. Um, we do uh, uh, outreach and education regarding smoke, um, from teaching classes to these texts that go out and let everybody know when we're doing prescribed burns and when to be ready for smoke so that people can use their air purifiers, they can close their windows, they can wear masks uh, and anything else they need to protect their health. Um, again, this is called the SmokeWise Ashland program. We have our website, smokewiseashland.org. We've accumulated a lot of information about smoke and health on that website, making it a one-stop shop for people to get that information and be able to use it to protect themselves and their families. Um, recently, we've taken on a new project, uh, adapting our city forest lands to climate change, which we hope will extend across our whole uh, fire shed slash watershed in the coming years. Um, you know, the as we've all seen already and experienced the smoke and the fire, there's going to be a lot more fire on the landscape. This is one study showing predicted changes uh, in the Pacific Northwest, more fire in the coming decades. You know, we're in the maybe 200 to 300 percent two to three times more fire than we already have. Er other areas of Oregon are going to see anywhere from four times to six to seven times more acres burned year to year. That's a big challenge. Getting our, our communities prepared is, is certainly tops of the list for us. Uh, moving on to the communities part of it from the landscapes, uh, we created a program called Fire Adapted Ashland. Again, stay in common terminology with the case of strategy. Um, FireAdaptedAshland.org is the website. Uh, trying to create that one-stop shopping for uh, people to go and get information about anything related to home reducing their home wildfire risk. Uh, I'll go through some of the programs that we offer under Fire Adapted Ashland. Uh, you can see some of them shown here on the web page. Um, you know, certainly the Almeda Fire, which this is a photo I took in um, the division that I worked in. Uh, was is a big motivating factor and uh, and certainly got a lot of people's attention. Um, we actually, even before the fire, had passed codes and ordinances, and this is where you know some of your five E's start to apply. Um, codes and ordinances. We we passed the entire uh, a redistricting of our entire uh, city as a wildland urban interface uh, back in 2018, along with an expansion of our wildfire safety ordinances. Uh, to address uh, not only vegetation, uh, but things like bark mulch, fence connections, and roof types. Um, we used to have a fire code, but it only it, uh, applied to a small uh, district of town, uh, a thin uh, border along our wild, uh, forest lands. But uh, we realized pretty quick that fire, wildfire is going to affect everywhere, potential to affect everywhere in Ashland. Um, you know, along with that, on the enforcement E, we have our weed abatement program. We do actively enforce that. Grass and weeds have to be cut to four inches after June fifteenth, and we do cite uh, people if they're not in compliance. So there's some enforcement for you. Um, we also adopted the Oregon Building Code Wildfire Hazard Mitigation Section R three twenty seven. That was completed in twenty twenty one. Um, that governs the uh, materials and construction techniques for all new construction in Ashland, residentially speaking, that has to meet this uh, chapter standards. Uh, so we're one of just two communities in Oregon who have done that code adoption. So we've done the whole land use ad code adoption and we've done the building code adoption uh, in or in Ashland. Uh, it did take years to get to that and it took a lot of uh, community education. So another E. Um, but we, when we got to that point, we had unanimous support through the city council. Uh, one of the examples under our codes is uh, non-flammable fence attachments to homes. That's a requirement. This was retrofitted at my friend's house because I twisted his arm and he was more than willing to do it. Uh, but this would be an example of one of the code requirements. Uh, on the incentive side, um, uh, economic incentives. We do have a FEMA pre-disaster mitigation grant from uh, mitigation, creating defensible space around the top 1,100 at-risk homes in Ashland uh, based on our own internal risk assessment. And that also replaces wood shake roofing uh, with class A shingles uh, or B. Um, both are, are allowed under city code. So we allow um, both of those. Uh, and we are a year into this program right now. And uh, 
hoping to replace our coordinator who uh, just moved on to another job. But here's a couple before and afters of what it looks like. You can see all the nasty junipers right around the deck. And the person was able to use the FEMA funds to take those out. Uh, a roof replacement in progress here. Um, a lot better option um, having a class A fire protection roof. Uh, for risk assessments, we have a volunteer program. I think this is a pretty unique thing that we do. Um, one-on-one -on -one wildfire risk assessments are the best, definitely the best way to communicate uh, to people what they need to do in terms of what the risk is, uh, creating priorities, um, and having uh, a staff person do it was a dream at one point we thought we could pull off, but uh, the need far outstripped uh, what we could supply. So we decided to train a cadre of volunteers to be able to do this. Um, we have seven volunteers that are active over the past year who did 250 assessments. And um, Brian Hendricks, our fire adapted communities coordinator who's uh, watching on this, um, tra just trained along uh, with a couple of our uh, previous RAP volunteers, 25 more who are finishing task books this month and getting signed off to do um, more and keep up with the demand out there in our community. Um, another uh, cool program that we put together is educating realtors and also home inspectors about wildfire risk. Uh, we look at the realty process as a unique point in time when you can make a lot of changes in a home and a landscape uh, if the education and awareness is there to do it. Uh, so Brian has been uh, teaching a class to realtors, and we also got the home inspectors uh, to take this class so that they can include it in home inspections, just like you would include uh, inspections of the foundation, plumbing, electrical system, anything else. Wildfire can be part of that home inspection. Uh, we do do a lot of education and outreach. Um, we've got a wildfire safety campaign that spans actually four months. One of our months is missing here. Um, that uh, each month is focused on a different topic. Uh, right now, we are working on um, uh, evacuation and we've got a smoke month and firewise. So um, we give uh, the residents a lot of opportunity uh, and a lot of outreach. Uh, just finished the green debris drop off day this last uh, weekend. Brian coordinated that as well. Um, over 200 loads were delivered of green debris that would otherwise have been around people's homes uh, during the fire season. Um, we have 35 firewise communities within Ashland who are largely self-sufficient at this point. Um, you know, we encourage them at every point we can to do more. Firewise is not a compulsory program. It does not meet codes, but it is very much about education and outreach um, and we do use our Firewise communities for wildfire season training, which is a bonus for them. Uh, Ashland is big on evacuations. We have uh, 10 zones laid out. Uh, many counties have gone to a zone system now across Oregon and the West. Um, we do a lot of outreach through Ready, Set, Go uh, to get uh, residents ready for the fire season. You saw we have a whole month dedicated to it in our campaign. Uh, this is something that was new to us just a couple of years ago and uh, is becoming uh, fairly common now. And last one I'm going to hit is the safe, effective wildfire response, last leg of the cohesive strategy. And uh, one of the things that we've really put a lot of time into is this uh, concept of pods or potential operational delineations. It's a tool being used across the country now by the U.S. Forest Service and other federal agencies tying together landscapes. Uh, through data that's mostly remotely sensed from satellites, uh, using a lot of fancy science and math um, through the Rocky Mountain Research Station and Oregon State University. In, uh, in our case, we've used the pods approach to both document the changes in the landscape that we've been able to affect through our fields reduction and prescribed burning programs and ashen forest resiliency, but also to help us create uh, priorities and tell us where the most important places on the landscape are based on our values at risk. Um, and then also in a response capacity, uh, PODS also displays the most uh, obvious places on the landscape to go for fire suppression success uh, based on uh, mapping out lots and lots of past fires. Uh, we have uh, an index called suppression difficulty that really can help uh, crews responding and uh, incident management teams to formulate strategies 
for containment of fires that um, give us a lot more to go on than just going out there and uh, drawing a box around it and creating contingency plans. Uh, that plan is essentially built ahead of time, which puts us uh, far ahead of the game when the bell goes off during the summer. And uh, lastly, putting uh, our folks out there uh, training uh, during this time of year. Actually, we're just doing this training right now. Uh, structure protection training, tying together uh, the work that we've done for fuels reduction and the codes. Uh, so letting our folks see our uh, communities out there, get a sense of access and uh, fuel loading, where they're going to be effective, where there are challenges. Uh, we do this every year, and uh, it's a great opportunity for our suppression personnel to get out there in the WUI uh, and uh, note the challenges and uh, opportunities and uh, make our structure protection plans and triage, protect, practice our triage out in the community uh, like we would do it during a real fire. So that kind of uh, wraps it up. Our three websites, fireadaptedashland.org, smokewiseashland.org, and ashlandwatershed.org um, encompass the three legs of the, the cohesive strategy. You're welcome to uh, peruse those, uh, send questions. And with that, uh, let's get to work. We're always trying to uh, come up with new and inventive ways to address our wildfire issues and uh, and to try to push the envelope where we can and get get more homes, more people prepared and create a landscape that is a lot safer than um, what we've inherited. So thank you so much for your time and look forward to the discussion. I am going to stop the share. There we go. All right. Back to you, Heather. Hey. Thank you so much, Chief Fingers. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I think between yours and Justice's programs, you, you give folks a lot to strive for as far as uh, the types of programs that you've implemented and um, how we all look at wildfire risk now in our state. So um, I know there's many departments out there that have bits and pieces here and there, but um, there's always more work to do, as you both have said. Um, we did have some folks make some comments just about um, uh, using maybe some other volunteer groups for doing those um, assessments like a CERT group or a medical reserve core. Is that something that you have access to or considered? Either one of you? We, you yeah. know, we didn't uh, jump into that. Sorry, I'll, I'll just be quick, Justice. Uh, we do, we have a CERT program and that would also seem like an obvious program to draw from. Um, we, but we solicited volunteers from anywhere we could find them, uh, but they really do have to go through a rigorous class, um, process. They did three weekends of classes and, uh, we designed a task book check off. Um, it's not something that I would really trust, uh, students to do unless they were paired with somebody who's an experienced assessor. Uh, it needs to be consistent and the training has to be top notch so that um, homeowners are getting an accurate snapshot of their risk and what they can do about it. Justice, do you have something to add? Yeah, that's great, Chris. Um, a couple of things. Um, we've developed a CE-based wildfire risk of training for our, our operational staff who are out there knocking on doors, offering uh, fire alarm installations. And very often in the past, they would leave a property that was at risk from wildfire and not have helped them with both fire safety issues. And so that's one direction we're steering. Can we leverage existing staff um, and the credibility they have? But like Chris, uh, through our FireWise Alliance, uh, we have a risk assessment, uh, train the trainer that we host. And, and when we get a request for an assessment in a FireWise community, it goes to the community itself. And if they need help, they reach out, but we shadow them um, as part of that training process. And then working with faith-based organizations, the Austin Disaster Relief Network, um, they have a really wide net and they're very active in um, post-incident uh, assistance and they wanted to get involved before the fire strikes. And so we did a, a training across their organization um, as well as with our CERT teams um, and our code enforcement officers. So uh, when they get complaints about wildfire, they wanna have the confidence to be able to 
um, articulate why they think that needs to be addressed through education and understanding wildfire risk. And so we're, we're trying to build an army of assessors because like Chris mentioned, there's no way with 150 people a day moving to Austin that we could really have an impact with that one-on-one -on -one approach. Awesome. Uh, do either of you have a, a follow-up program with your assessments? Yeah, you know, that's something we've talked a lot about, building um, a boots on the ground um, uh, program. You know, oftentimes our FEMA eligible properties are being assessed by our volunteer assessors and we can hand them over to our grant coordinator who can then actually fund the mitigation piece of it. But for homeowners who don't qualify for any financial assistance, it is a bit of a struggle, especially if they've got economic challenges uh, to getting the mitigation done. Um, that we we really got to work on creating some kind of network of um, of help, especially for lower lower income residents. You know, people who can pay for the work. There are businesses out there who are servicing the people in the FEMA grant program who can turn around and do you know work for hire and get. They know what the, the specs. They know how to get the work done. You know, but it's going to cost people you know at least two or three thousand dollars, if not quite a bit more. Um, so we are we're trying to envision a program of volunteers and uh, and help. But, you know, ultimately, at some point, financial help is is needed to get people over the top on some of these projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're working with service based organizations uh, like Team Rubicon to help assist those uh, populations that can't necessarily implement the recommendations, even though the awareness and will might be present, but I think we're still in the fledgling aspect of that voluntary compliance part of our program. Um, so the, predominantly our assessments are educational. There's been some sensitivity with residents about um, uh, identifying their wildfire risk, which we know what it is, uh, the cat's out of the bag, but right, for some reason writing that down and keeping that form on file kind of has been a, a comfort issue. I think we're overcoming that. Um, but initially, our assessments got handed directly to the homeowner, and it was for them and their benefit, not for um, our assessment purposes. So with uh, adopting codes locally, what kind of response did you get from the public when you first started heading down that road? Yeah, for us in Austin, um, when my um, predecessor who had attempted to adopt the code, who's one of the smartest people I've ever met, um, told me on day one that um, he tried to get the code adopted and it resulted in mass hate emails. And so um, he helped me understand the points of contact that he had missed with our environmental partners and other community representatives. So I spent a lot of time making sure um, before we went to the dais with our code proposal that our public was on board. Uh, they understood the need and the value of uh, the code that our Home Builders Association and other stakeholders um, understood the, the value to them and the residents that they're uh, building these homes for. And so our goal was to eliminate as much opposition and misunderstanding before we um, went to the dais. And what helped us is on that day of adoption, members from our Firewise communities without solicitation showed up and said, we need this as a city. We can't afford not to adopt this important code. Um, please support the fire department in helping us be safe. And so that's where that grassroots effort comes in. Um, it can help you with avoiding potential conflicts because um, Texas is a private property rights state. Code isn't a, a good word here. And so generally you've got to have a real strong understanding of uh, why you're going to insist on dictating how someone does something here. And so we, we spent um, years building that consensus before we move forward with our actual adoption. I, I have a similar story in Ashland. Uh, we really tried to um, you know, beat the bushes and figure out who would not be supporting our code proposal and uh, and address it. The, the Builders Association, Home Builders Association was really tepid on it uh, initially, as were a lot of the landscapers and landscape architects who were going to have to comply with it. Uh, so we met with them. We tried to figure out what the, the hiccups were in the code, if we could change some things, make it more digestible, dispel any myths. 
And, uh, and ultimately they don't, they didn't love it, but they tolerated it. And I think that's as much as we, we could have asked at that point. And, um, and then we also had a lot of concern over insurance rates, whether or not, um, you know, adopting the whole city as this wildfire urban interface um, or wildfire hazard zone in, in our planning language would change people's insurance rates. And there was a lot of consternation about that. We went out and polled all the insurance companies that we could find and asked them, you know, how do you come up with your insurance rates for wildfire protection and wildfire specifically? And, you know, to the T, they all said, you, Ashland's local adoption of a code and an area has going to have no effect on these now, you know, big national risk assessments that companies are using. Um, it's it's not something that people that they are going to pay attention to in the industry because they've got very sophisticated risk assessment going on on the back end of their policies already. Both sound like really great approaches there. Um, so for both of you with your uh, codes that you have in place, um, you mentioned uh, weed abatement and that sort of thing. Who does the um, enforcement on those codes? Is that uh, like a city code officer or is it through the fire department? Yeah, for Austin, um, because we're a civil service uh, fire department in our collective bargaining agreement, um, it requires a sworn uniform personnel to conduct any inspections. And so they're members of our prevention division and uh, their salary is offset with permitting fees. So our code implementation is net zero cost for us in um, Austin and um, uh, the ETJ where we enforce the code. But we the WUI code is an all encompassing. So when it comes to other aspects of the code, um, emergency apparatus clearing, uh, nuisance, um, we rely on our code enforcement department. And as I mentioned, have trained them to be able to quantify and understand wildfire risk. Um, as well. And so it really comes down to more of a team effort. Um, we do the structure hardening and our code enforcement does the vegetation compliance. Very similar story here as well. Um, we have a fire life safety specialist position who's in charge of the weed abatement code enforcement. We do work with our code enforcement officer. Um, the, uh, that person can address other code issues, uh, some related to fire, some not. Uh, but we have that in-house on the weed abatement part of it. The trick with uh, that is the people who don't comply. And uh, that's been a, a challenge for us because we we have to follow through when we um, find people that are out of compliance. And that means going toward uh, through an entire process of citation to forced uh, abatement and putting a lien on the property for the cost incurred to uh, force the abatement. And uh, you know that means we have to have money on hand to do that. And the money that we get back, we may not see uh, for many, many years before uh, you know a property is sold and the lien is paid off. So uh, that becomes kind of a liability in our budget. But nonetheless, a uh, an absolute necessity. Uh, we were we managed to actually increase our abatement budget this coming budget cycle. Um, but um, it's been it has been a continuing uh, challenge for us. All right. I've been monitoring the chat and looks like you guys have too. So I think we're caught up on questions and such. Um encourage folks that are online if you have a question to pop it in the chat now because we are coming up on our time. We certainly want to be respectful to everyone's schedules. Um and I think we're set to go here. So I certainly want to thank Justice and um Chief Chambers for their time and their presentations. Uh, the information you guys have shared today, I think, is certainly uh, helpful to those that are striving to do more uh, wildfire prevention and education and outreach in their communities. And um, you guys have set the bar high, and uh, we certainly appreciate you sharing uh, your programs with us and uh, what we can all do to uh, make our communities more fire safe. So. With that, I am going to share out that um, this is just a part of a series of webinars that our office is hosting. And so we will continue uh, with those webinars through May and into June. Um, and so our next webinar coming up is on May 16th, talking about community wildfire protection plans and all those entail. And uh, you can go to our website, which you can click on that QR code and it'll take you there to our 
wildfire awareness page and uh, register for these following um, webinars as they come up. So with that, I think that's all we have for today. And I thank everyone for uh, joining us and um, hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.